Thank you very much for joining us. We agreed we would uh, talk in uh, English today uh, because we want to reach a wider uh, community in uh, when when making these discussions. So um, our lecturer today uh, in Digital Society Talks uh, is Maria Mitrovic Stankulov from the Institute of Physics, University of Belgrade, and she would uh, introduce the topic of uh, sociophysics to us, which is uh, very uh, interesting because it is new for uh, us in uh, the domain of uh, social sciences. Uh, and uh, we are very eager to learn about this issue and how we can uh, use sociophysics and the knowledge and the uh, theoretic knowledge and applied uh, applied method and methods uh, in um, examining the social sphere. So we are, we are glad uh, we are hosting today uh, Maria, uh, who is uh, Associate Research Professor at Scientific Computing, Computing Laboratory and Head of Innovation Center and uh, at the Institute of Physics in Belgrade. Uh, she completed her PhD in Statistical Physics at the Faculty of Physics in Belgrade in 2012. Uh, during her PhD studies, she was employed at the Department of Theoretical Physics Institute of Jozef Stefan, Slovenia. And during that time, she was participant at uh, EU FP7 project, Cyber Emotions, Collective Emotions in cy Cyberspace. She undertook postdoctoral work at the Department of uh, Biomedical Engineering and uh, Computational Science, School of Science, uh, Aalto University, Finland. She has extensive knowledge and experience in theoretical and computational physics. Her primary research interest uh, is statistical physics in socioeconomic systems and complex network theory. She is an author of 23 publications in leading international scientific journals, including Nature and Nature Communications, five book chapters, and more than 35 invited and contributed talks at international conferences. Uh, wow, thank you very much for, for talking to us today, Maria. Uh, we are uh, happy to, to, to hear uh, your perspective and to get these uh, different ways of looking at uh, society uh, from 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 your view today. Okay, uh, um, so thank you for inviting me, Yuvisha, to come and and give a talk about uh, the topic I'm I'm I, I've started 15 years ago, and um, something that is uh, is quite uh, uh, untypical for Serbia, but I would say that many. Uh, many scientists working in, in, in our field in, in Europe and in the world actually um, do this for the past 20, 25 years, even more. So, um, uh, I want to tell you why physicists are so much interested in, in these kind of topics. So, these are some systems in physics that we study for the past, I would say, 100, 150 years. And uh, these are uh, systems that exhibit this collective behavior. This means that this system consists of very large number of interacting units. And under certain conditions, uh, these systems exhibit a behavior that is very untypical and cannot be predicted from the behavior of individual units. One is definitely the most exotic thing that we know for more than 50 years, I would say. It's a helium two. So helium under certain conditions and under temperatures that are very, very below the temperatures of, 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 of room temperatures. So they're on several Kelvin temperatures. They start to behave very strangely. They, uh, the, the helium exhibits um, uh, so-called superfluidic behavior. This means that it doesn't see any obstacles. And what we see here is that when you put a glass in a helium, although the glass is not, um, uh, its walls are above the surface of a helium, helium tends to go upstairs, so crawls on the walls of, of, a, of, a, of a container and goes into the, um, 
into the container, which usually don't see if you put, for instance, in the same way you, you put the glass uh, in, in a water, okay? And uh, basically what we see is that helium does not have viscosity anymore. And this kind of behavior was observed um, in, in the first half of 20th century. And then scientists developed the whole, so physicists developed the whole uh, framework to study this kind of behavior and explain it. And the consequence, uh, they show that this is a consequence of interactions in, in a helium. So this is one of the things that we see as a collective behavior. Definitely any type of uh, crystal structure is a consequence of interactions and, and finding minimal energy uh, 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 spaces. So basically what we see is that for instance, a graphite or carbon has two allotropic modifications. And what we see it is that actually the, the, the atoms of carbon can be in two different types of, of crystal structure. But the most interesting thing for me as a physicist is magnetic systems. We all know about permanent magnets. Believe it or not, permanent magnets only exist be below some certain critical temperature called Kiri temperature. And what was shown is that actually what magnets uh, can be, how we explain magnets is that um, in a very simple picture, there are spins on a lattice, uh, in a, uh, on a crystal lattice, and they interact with each other and have tendency to align with each other, but there are thermal fluctuations that lead to these um, uh, kind of changes in, in the system uh, that tend to uh, disalign these spins. And the stronger the, the, the interaction between them, the higher the critical temperature. About the critical temperature, basically the temperature fluctuations win and spins tend to disalign and kind of create a very chaotic thing in which you don't have a, a, a magnet system, but below this critical temperature called Curie temperature, you have the whole set of states. So only on the temperature uh, of zero Kelvin, which we don't, or close to zero, all states or spins are aligned. Otherwise, they actually change their positions, but on average, we, we measure as a, as a, a non-zero magnetization in the system. Uh, what was shown is that actually the structure of this uh, lattice a lot influences, so the, 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 the topology of interactions between spins influences where the Curie temperature will be how this behavior will show and so on. So physicists study collective behavior for more than, I would say, 100 years. And um, when we talk about collective behavior, it's not just about physical systems. We also see it in, a, in a social systems, in biological systems, in all sorts of systems that surround us and that we have our experience uh, with every day. And what we basically, um, see is that uh, social systems have tendency of this collective behavior. So if any one of you was on some uh, big event uh, at stadium, or even if you definitely went to theater uh, show, you saw this kind of collective behavior. So in the stadium, you see Mexican wave. Okay, no one says to people, now you stand and, and, and sit down, but people follow their neighbors and follow what they're doing. And then uh, as a consequence of this interaction, we see this wave that goes through the whole uh, stadium. Uh, in, a, in a nature, we see this all the time. So if you ever observed the birds, flock of birds, they fly in a formation without a center of force. They interact with each other, they adapt to each other, and basically they create these beautiful um, uh, patterns of, of uh, bird flocks. Similar happens with fishes. And definitely what we see today is, is uh, these uh, riots or, or protests and other things, they, they kind of happen spontaneously. Usually you don't have some central force this, that says to people go out and go uh, protest against something, but the fact that your neighbors and your friends go to protest kind of promotes this kind of behavior. Uh, definitely um, the things we are currently living, this COVID thing, uh, basically the epidemic spreading of, of coronavirus 
is social and collective behavior, because otherwise, if we don't interact with each other, we wouldn't have pedants. And uh, actually, um, all uh, tools and methods that people developed in, in so to say, uh, last 100 years, but very uh, large number or a large amount of them was developed in the past 20 years, help us to kind of predict this kind of behavior, to understand it, and to understand how interactions influence emergence of this collective behavior. So uh, interactions are in the center of this, and actually they're in the center of sociophysics in some sense. So what we know from physics is that the structure of interaction network influences what type of, of uh, collective behavior we, will emerge. But then we also know from, from sociology for past 70 or almost 100 years that their social uh, systems also can be studied using social networks. And actually, if we look at our world, it's connected. And the topology of these networks is not either regular or random, but has some specific topology that we usually call complex networks. And we use tools and methods of complex networks to study these kind of systems. As you can see from online networks, we, use, we are currently using Zoom, but actually email network is, is a type of this network. Our words also create a network. Airports and, and, and uh, how we travel is can be represented as a network and our brain is a network. So networks are basically, we, they have tendency to say that they're everywhere. Human is a part of network, but also our uh, cells, our brain, and us as, as a persons are also created of, of networks. Um, when we talk about physics and, and sociology, uh, we think it's something new, but actually this is not true. Uh, this is I usually say a relationship that uh, exists for more than two centuries. Um, actually, uh, a study from, from, from statisticians and sociologists like two or three centuries ago was something that motivated uh, physicists to create statistical physics. Because at that time, um, uh, physicists uh, had Newton physics and, and it was thought that this is everything we should know about nature and this solves everything. Of course, later we realized that this is just, just the scratch of the, of the surface, surface, but uh, at that time we were able to deal with one or two body systems. Already three body system is a, is a big deal for physics. And uh, if you look at, at uh, gases, which were very interesting at, at that time, uh, you have uh, Avogadro number of, of particles in a gas, which is 10 to the 23rd, um, a number of, of elements, which is impossible to calculate even today with all the resources we have. So physicists realized that uh, these, that sociologists have found these different kind of, of very steady patterns in a society, and then they realized that they can use the same thing for, for, for gases. So Adolf Ketele was one of the people who actually started this idea. He studied different kinds of patterns from a number of suicides in, in a region, uh, and he noticed that these uh, number of suicides are pretty much stable, steady, if you look on the level of certain regions and if you average it on a certain uh, time period. Um, he studied uh, the, the, the height of people, the, the, the um, uh, circumvent of, of, of head and so on. And he noticed there are certain very stable patterns, although you cannot say for a specific person, but you know, you see some laws, statistical laws in this. And uh, August Comte is definitely someone who had this idea of, you know, at that time, uh, Newton physics was like considered that we kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, close the picture about the physical world. And now only we need socio sociology to find the laws of social uh, systems. And then we will describe the whole world. Of course, this is something that kind of uh, was 
um, uh, was is, is a nice dream, but we kind of uh, forgot about this because the most important thing that kind of started physics in a way we see today is that uh, up to uh, uh, 15th or 16th century, 16th or 17th century, scientists didn't do experiments. They only were using this uh, thinking and, and they were deciding about the world based on this. But then they started measuring and then they uh, started uh, extracting the laws from these measurements and observations, okay? Uh, for sociology, this wasn't that simple because uh, uh, we didn't have resources and tools to do this. But luckily, by development of information communication technologies, today uh, we have this opportunity to uh, collect large amounts of data. We create huge amounts of data every day because we uh, use cell phones, we, we, we use credit cards, we use online com uh, communication. So we leave these fingerprints of our behavior. And the good thing is that we can use these data and find some statistical laws based on this. And what I will show you is that we actually uh, can use these data and, and some laws that we find in this can very, be very, uh, very interesting for us. Um, but before that, um, this is not how the physics entered sociology. Actually, the idea about uh, modeling social behavior is a little bit older. And um, when I show you the, 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 uh, the magnetization and how physicists study this, we develop a relatively simple models to study these kind of collective behavior in physical systems. So these spins, so spin can go in some very simple way, it can be up or down in some very simple models. And then people and sociologists realize that, okay, in some cases you can actually use these models to model uh, social behavior or opinion dynamics. And then there was a whole uh, group of, of very simple models, we call them toy models, that were used to explain some kind of collective behavior. I've, I've mentioned just some of them. Uh, what is good is that now with, we have these information communication technologies, we can actually validate these models and we can create more complex models that can uh, recreate uh, some kind of collective behavior we are interested in. So uh, in physics, the idea is that your system consists of very large number of, of interacting units, and each of these units is a kind of, um, can be uh, considered as an element, but you can forget about the, the, the specific properties of these of this units. Uh, so we can talk about social atom, social atom as a human, so the, the constituent of, of a social system. And actually what we found out by studying different kinds of patterns is that uh, it kind of resembles, it has some very, uh, very stable laws of behavior, especially if you, we, if you look at collective behavior and uh, social systems and human behavior is uh, self-organized. So this means usually you don't have, for many collective behaviors, you don't have some, um, uh, not for many, for any collective behavior, you don't have some central force that will guide the system, but uh, the collective behavior emerges as a consequence of interaction. And um, uh, in this case, we can say that social system is a building element of a society and that interactions between humans actually lead to emergence of this collective behavior. But of course, unlike uh, typical physical atoms, social atom has some um, things that are dissimilar, that makes it a very specific one. Social atoms are heterogeneous. And uh, if you look at humans, we are quite different in some sense, uh, depending what you're looking at. Social atoms learn, humans learn, and they learn how to adapt. Um, they also have a tendency, if they look at, at behavior of others, to copy their behavior. And um, humans are definitely not isolated. They, they adapt their behavior to their surroundings, so to their neighbors and also to their environment, intentionally or accidentally, that doesn't. But uh, as I will show you, 
even we ha though we have this kind of behavior and this kind of differences from a typical physical atom, you can actually use the idea and the notion of social atom and uh, incorporate all of these uh, specificities of the social atom and model it and, and find these kind of uh, social laws or, or, or very stable patterns. What uh, I was uh, usually um, motivating for, for, for this kind of uh, studying is that we actually see in a social system so-called order and disorder phase. If you remember at my first slide, I mentioned uh, magnets. Um, magnet that a permanent magnet is a kind of ordered state. So spins have tendency to be aligned with each other. Uh, it's not a frozen state because you have these thermal fluctuations, so they, they fluctuate, but on average, you have a, an ordered state, state of the system. If you look at this, some very simple examples of, of social systems, when the group of people gets together, they communicate, they share in information, and very often in the end, they come up with some common opinion about certain things. This is also a kind of example of uh, transition between this disorder state to order state. And what we usually see is that in these kind of situations, network topology plays a very, very important role. Uh, complex network theory uh, is not a new field. Actually, complex network theory is, but actually graphs in mathematics and social networks in sociology exist for a quite long time. So this, the notion was not new, but development of, uh, of information communication technologies allowed us to collect large networks, information about large networks, large number of interactions and to study them using some different kind of tools and methods. Uh, however, um, we know that these networks have certain, you know, uh, certain uh, similar or, or very uh, typical properties. So social networks are said to be small, small world networks. And this is known since 16th of, of previous century where basically uh, Milgram made a, a very interesting experiment where he sent letters uh, to America. And was uh, the idea of the experiment was that you, uh, the, I think around 1,000 letters were sent out. Uh, the, the, the destination of letter was one. So it was chosen uh, in advance and he chose 1,000 people to start the chain. And he said, uh, send it to uh, that specific person in, I think, New York. Uh, if you know that person, if you don't know that person, please send it to uh, one of your friends that you know or, or uh, peers that you think it might know that person. And uh, through this sending, there was uh, a type of, of, of information that was uh, collected on, on, on letters, so the stamps, and in the end, Milgram could calculate the number of resendings or the number of, of people that uh, on average uh, had to resend the letter to, to uh, get that letter to final destination. And what he found out is that the world is small. So although you have a large uh, uh, US uh, at the time, the large population of US, the number of, of uh, links between two, any two uh, people in US was six. Uh, today, we know by studying Facebook that this number is even smaller. Based on Facebook, I think it's somewhere in between three and four. So world is really small, although the population is very large. We know that social networks are clustered. This means that uh, if, especially, this is very specific for social networks, if, uh, two P if I have two friends, there is a high probability that they will also be friends with each other. Uh, we know that networks, complex networks, but also social networks are heterogeneous. In 1999, there was a seminal paper from uh, Albert Barabashi and Rek Albert. Uh, they, they studied the World Wide Web. 
But what they were uh, able to find out is that these networks are very heterogeneous. This means that uh, the number of connections follows power law degree distribution. Uh, five years ago, we were able to show uh, that, uh, to quantify how complex networks are, how much they are complex, because they're not random, but they're not regular. And what we found out is that basically you only have to keep several of, of properties of network to basically recreate something that is the original network. Uh, what we know from physics is that there is an interplay between the network structure and dynamics, and uh, that uh, the dynamics and function of uh, complex systems, also including social systems, strongly depends on the interaction network in the system. Uh, physicists very much like to study agent-based models because they help us to, from one side to understand the behavior or some system in a very simple way, but also they, they can help us with uh, creating very specific societies. And uh, what is the most important uh, ingredients of this is that we actually set up some very simple rules of behaving of agents and rules of their uh, interaction. And based on this, we are able to use computers to model the society and to study, uh, make basically online experience, uh, a virtual experience with, with the society, which we cannot do in the in a, in a, in a real world. Um, I'm just going to tell you shortly about one very simple model and uh, which was created in 70s and it actually kind of start of this modeling of society. It's a very simple shelling uh, model of segregation dynamics. Uh, the idea is that you put a world on a chessboard originally. Now we use a square lattice in, in the computers. Uh, the chess fields are houses uh, and you assume that you have two population of two types of people. So basically two populations. This can uh, represent a race, it can uh, represent an economical class and so on. What Shannon wanted to understand is using this model is uh, whether we really only have a segregation in a case where people are very intolerant or actually there is some um, uh, a, a critical point uh, or of uh, tolerance on which there is this kind of transition. Uh, the rules of these models are very simple. The happiness of, of, uh, of, uh, of an agent is related to uh, his or her tolerance. A uh, fraction of neighbors in, in his neighborhood of different color from him, uh, if it's a bigger than his star or her tolerance, the agent is moving. So changing place of, of, of uh, home, basically. But you can find out in a very simple way through numerical simulations is that you find that there is a critical uh, value of, of this tolerance and it's 0 0.5 if people are very tolerant, so above 0 0.5. So this means 50% or more. Uh, uh, so they, they accept that their, their neighborhood can be very, very mixed. Uh, you have a frozen state and a uh, high level of happiness of society, so it doesn't change. So people don't have tendency to move, okay? And your population is very much mixed. But if the tolerance is below 0 0.5, so people don't um, stand that they're more than 50% of, uh, of their neighborhood is of other color, uh, you have a, a situation where frozen state, so this mixed state only exists for, for certain critical uh, population density. And this population density depends on, on, uh, on, on tolerance level. Uh, what is important is from this uh, model is that actually you see that even if people are kind of tolerant, 0.4 is already a tolerant person, you still have these segregated uh, places on a chessboard. So people tend to live in the neighborhoods that are of the same uh, color, so to say, color in this sense is is just uh, is just a, a property of of agents. So here you have a very simple model that can actually explain certain kind of segregations, even in a very tolerant society. Um, a 
of course, these models are very simple. And as I said, uh, development of ICTs and computer resources allowed us to create very complex models. And uh, in my past you know, 15 years of work, we have created very different types of model to study different kinds of collective behavior, uh, starting from collective emotions with emotional engines, then collective knowledge build building, conference participations, and, and for instance, even to predict mobility in a, in a society. And these models are usually much more complex. Uh, the, the structure of network is not a chess anymore, so your agents can have different number of interactions, this network can evolve, and actually very often we include this uh, feedback process, so behavior of agents can also change the, the, the network of your interactions. Interactions can be of different type. Today we know that we can study temporal networks, but also we know that, for instance, in a society, uh, interactions between two people can have very different uh, flavors. So basically, we talk about multiplex networks. So one person can communicate with its or her friends uh, using Facebook, uh, cell phone, face to face, and so on. And all of these interactions can be uh, mapped onto multiplex networks and can be studied their patterns and how they actually depend uh, on each other. So we can actually find out very, very interesting properties of the system based on this. Uh, so, uh, as I said, uh, for instance, just to, to show you what we can create from, from a network, from, from uh, models, uh, this is the, the work I have done five years ago. Uh, it's about collective knowledge building. We use empirical data from online communities, question and answer, stock exchange. So people who actually use computers, they already heard for stock overflow. We use the data from, from mathematics, from the same community, just studying and, and thinking about mathematics. Uh, and what we found out is that uh, knowledge building is a combinatorial pro process. So we have tendency to know already some pieces of knowledge and then create new combination of it. And using our uh, methodology and our models, we have shown that actually you can use um, uh, methods for studying temporal network, uh, temporal uh, time series and, and to find out uh, some specific properties of the system. What we found out from our emotional, uh, collective emotions and also for collective knowledge building is that social systems uh, we say are in self-organized criticality state. So this means that basically uh, uh, we can predict that there is going to be some outburst of emotions, negative or positive ones, but we cannot uh, predict the, the size of these outbursts, so these avalanches. Uh, so in that sense, they're very similar to, for instance, uh, earthquakes and, and av other avalanche dynamics. So this is something that kind of physics bring to, to this uh, situation. Um, mobility. Um, it seems that uh, while we can use the data from cell phones to, to study the mobility or to find mobility pat patterns in one community, this kind of pose a lot of uh, threats to privacy of people and, and uh, to their uh, behavior. So what we realized that we can actually use the network of communication, but not communication of a specific person, but only to look at, at communication between different cell phone towers and based on this, you can very much and very nicely predict the mobility in the city and in the country. Uh, this is kind of very important thing, for instance, in the case when you have um, uh, epidemic spreading, because in that case, you can actually use this information about the mobility to model the epidemic spreading through uh, some city or through uh, uh, country, because uh, while social networks are an important uh, uh, spreader of so contacts, are important uh, um, way of spreading the disease, the mobility tells you what will be the next place where the, the, the epidemics will uh, show up, the disease will show up. And um, while models are interesting thing, what we uh, uh, use is actually empirical data. And this is what kind of started the whole story about sociophysics uh, to develop so fast. Uh, data are everywhere, believe it or not. So we uh, use 
mostly online data because they're very easily available and they are already in a form that can be easily collected and manipulated with. But uh, in, uh, in uh, a few years ago, we have shown that actually even uh, the data from a Nobel Prize Committee and people who won the Nobel Prize can be used to see what is the current state of the science uh, in, in the world. And what we have shown is that actually uh, we are long in, uh, we are waiting more and longer and longer to get a Nobel Prize. So I'm also joking with my colleagues, uh, there is a Nobel Prize for physics that if they want a Nobel Prize, they of course have to do something very, very big, big but they also have to take care of their health because uh, today physicists are waiting more than 30 years to get a Nobel Prize from the moment they made seminal work to the moment they get a Nobel Prize. And this time even grows longer and what we see it's exponential growth and our estimate is that it, at the end of this century most of the physicists will die by the time they, <laughs> they, they, they get to a, a place to get their Nobel Prize. Uh, the reason for this can be different uh, and actually this is where models can help us. Uh, we believe that uh, probably, at least in physics, we collected most of the low-lying fruits, and now it takes much longer time to actually make uh, 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 some very seminal work, but also um, uh, it takes a lot more uh, uh, funds to do this. So probably this is one of the reasons. So we are basically now coming back to, to, to search for, for seminal works like very long, long before. Um, what we found out also from empirical analysis is that uh, uh, the patterns, the way we vote is, uh, is, is quite stable. So we studied uh, patterns from uh, elections, parliamentary elections from 15 different states and usually parliamentary elections from different years in these states. And what we found out is that for countries like Italy, Poland, Finland, Denmark, and Estonia, they have the distribution of performance of candidates at these elections is very stable. So it doesn't depend on their uh, history. It doesn't depend on their culture. It doesn't depend on the size of the country, nothing. The reason for this is that all of these countries have a very same rules of voting. So there are lists with parliamentary elections with open lists where basically you don't just choose a party, but you also choose a person from the list of that party that will present you in a, in a, in a parliament. Uh, what we found out is that uh, while other countries don't, that have different kind of, of rules, they uh, don't have the same distribution if you compare different countries, but within one country, if the rules don't change, the distribution stays the same. So it's very stable in time. Uh, uh, besides this, for instance, I showed this uh, Estonia number one. So Estonia changed the rules after, uh, I think, 2011. And after that, they actually um, switched to semi-open lists and the distribution changed. So they don't, so the change of the rules kind of decides on the distribution of performance of candidates. Uh, what is even more striking is that the same distribution you can see in the way how scientists uh, cite the papers. So our colleagues studied all sorts of different kinds of scientific literature. So basically what they were looking, they looked at uh, different kind of uh, scientific fields. They look at uh, papers from these fields, number of their citations. They calculated the average number of citations for the paper in this field. Uh, they calculated the performance for every of, of papers in the field and they follow the, the log normal distribution. What they saw is that if you do this for every field, you will get one uh, distribution. So the pattern stays the same. This tells us that regardless of the field uh, specificities, like uh, in some fields people tend to cite more, in some fields they don't cite that much, uh, some fields are newer, some fields are interdisciplinary, that doesn't matter, okay? You see something that is quite universal. And this is something that we see in physical systems. 
So there we don't care about specificities of atoms or specificities of system, but only the interactions are that one that play an important role. So that's, that's why we see these kind of universalities also in the social systems. Uh, in empirical analysis, we can also study the behavior of, of, of specific humans. And what we found out, for instance, so um, uh, colleagues, uh, this is from emails, but also colleagues studied how people, how Einstein and other scientists were replying to their emails. And what they found out is that the time between the moment they receive their mail and then they reply kind of follows power law uh, distribution, okay? And then uh, a few years ago, so 15, 16 years ago, people studied this with emails and they found that the pattern is the same, okay? And then after 10 years after that, or six years after that, we studied the behavior of humans online. And believe it or not, humans have this kind of bursty behavior. So we have tendency to, uh, when we, uh, for instance, when we call, uh, I call now and then I make a little bit, uh, a certain number of other calls, you know, in a very short period of time. And then these periods of time are followed with very long, long uh, times of my, my inactivity. This is true for cell phone calls. This is true for emails. This is true for mails. This is true for activity online. So this is something that is kind of human thing. So something that is very standard for humans and not, uh, not something that is defined by, by specific culture or specific history or specific system in which we interact. And we wouldn't know about this if we didn't have empirical analysis. So uh, I have a few sides about networks. Uh, networks are important uh, in the center of, of our research. So whether we do numerical and uh, so simulations or we do empirical analysis, we always start from a network of interactions because we develop the whole framework and tools and methods to study their uh, structure and to describe their structure quanti quantitatively, but also to study their, uh, their, their evolution. Uh, for instance, uh, by studying social network, we can find out a lot about uh, development of, 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 a social, um, uh, of a social group. In, uh, in 2016, we studied uh, a system uh, that, uh, that was about conference participation of scientists. And what we found out was that scientists actually uh, have tendency to attend uh, conferences from the same series. The reason for this is that they develop their network of, of colleagues that also attend these conferences and they have a need to kind of strengthen these interactions with their colleagues. So the topic of the conference, the, 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 the key note speakers or the location of conference doesn't influence this kind of behavior. Uh, what is even more interesting is that we found out actually that the same behavior we can see also in offline groups. So people in offline groups have tendency to uh, stick to the, the specific uh, groups uh, that they already have connections with. In the beginning, when they join the group, they, they, they enlarge or expand the, the, the circle of their uh, con social connections. But then after some time, they have tendency to show up with their colleagues, their friends that were already uh, the, with whom they already made the connection in order to strengthen these kind of relationships. And we can actually find out, find out this from empirical analysis using complex network theory. Uh, the same thing can be used to actually study taste, human taste. So colleagues from, uh, from US actually um, collected the online recipes. Uh, they made a network of, of, uh, of uh, uh, ingredients, different kind of ingredients that go to these recipes. And what they found out is that successful recipes are always uh, have some universal principles or some specific network patterns behind it, it which is irre irrelevant of, of, of the culture from which the recipe comes from. So basically what we see is the network can actually, now complex network theory can tells a lot about universal principles and universal behavior of, of, of systems. In the end, 
um, um, complex network theory actually help us to, to find out not just about the structure, current structure of the system, but using modeling of complex networks, we can actually reveal a lot about the, the, the evolution of the system and the mechanisms that drive that system. Uh, I already mentioned one of the seminal papers from Barabashi and Albert. Um, uh, they uh, didn't just study the, the, the distribution of, 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 of number of links on the World Wide Web, but they actually proposed a very simple linking, linking rule models where they show the preferential attachment. So basically when a new node comes to a system, it has tendency to connect with already very well connected nodes. So, uh, the choice of, of old node is proportional to number of links that that old node already has. And uh, this preferential attachment is something that kind of motivated uh, 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 activity of physicists working in complex network theory in the last 20th century. But not just that. In the meantime, we actually developed and, uh, and found out about the other properties of complex and social networks and developed other models that can explain how these specific networks evolve. What we are currently doing uh, in my group is that we like to understand how other growth processes, so how uh, the number arrival of new uh, nodes to the network or arrival of new links in the network kind of shapes this, in combining some with some linking rules, kind of shapes the, 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 the evolution of specific system. The important thing about this is that we actually can use these models to, uh, on one side, understand how certain uh, groups evolved. On the other side, we can understand what should we do if we want to evolve a certain specific system. Um, just to summarize, uh, I, I hope uh, I didn't <laughs> overstep uh, my time, but. Uh, uh, so physics is interested in collective behavior and we are interested in dynamics mostly uh, and the structure. And we want to understand um, the dynamics of social phenomena by studying, as a, by studying it as a many body systems. We already have developed some framework for this. We have some paradigms in, our, in the statistical physics and we are now developing more tools that can help us to quantitatively study these kinds of systems. Um, statistical physics, yes, we provide some methods and tools for quantitative study and for a little bit different uh, uh, point of view in, in, in sociology, but uh, in social systems. But uh, what is the most important thing for me is that um, in the past 10, 15 years, Basically, we are witnessing emergence of new interdisciplinary field called computational social science, where physicists, computer, computer scientists, sociologists, mathematicians, psychologists, econo economists, and other disciplines join together to work together on, on specific problems of society, uh, try to explain and use different kinds of approaches and methods and knowledge from different kinds of disciplines to understand how certain collective behavior emerges in social systems and to try to be able to predict it. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. I would uh, like to ask you guys to prepare some questions if you if you have some uh, it was very inspiring to uh, hear you and to to see uh, all these new ideas for us about uh, patterns uh, and how how you see uh, the social dynamics and and structures uh, so um, if you have any questions i would like to uh, to, to give you the floor to ask ask some uh, and uh, you can also uh, use chat to to ask questions we do have uh, two persons here uh, in the room actually uh, that can also uh, ask something if interested uh, and I'm uh, pretty interested in the ways uh, you use these um, uh, you, you do the, the research uh, in practical 
uh, ways you do that. So, uh, can you explain us? Uh, you know, we have seen all these amazing stuff uh, that come from uh, from the way you know. Sometimes when we're young, we see we we are amazed by these shapes in the nature and everything around us. And uh, I, I see that in uh, sociophysics, I see that in uh, getting these patterns for, for, and shapes in the nature. Uh, first, my, my, my first question is actually, uh, do you see some kind of, uh, um, uh, is there any kind of uh, spiritual way at looking at this uh, research in terms of you know, we're amazed by, by, by the way the cosmos looks like and by the, uh, by the way this is reflected in nature uh, in, uh, in, in different shapes, uh, uh, for example, Puj and how it looks like. And I recognize this uh, at the beginning of your, um, your presentation where we, we see these, uh, the, these shapes uh, repeating uh, again. Uh, is there some uh, uh, secrets that you can uh, reveal to us because, uh, uh, you know, to make this uh, uh, a little bit um, out of science? Uh, and the second is uh, a question uh, which is very pragmatic. Uh, which tools uh, you use? What are the tools that you, you like using when doing the research? Uh, do you do you use Twitter data or, or something else? Do you use APIs? Do you use, uh, you know, what, which software do you use? Do you use R and things like that when you're, when you're actually uh, doing the dat data analysis? Uh, so maybe it's a little bit uh, uh, <laughs> technical and the first one is so abstract, uh, but uh, I would uh, really like to, to open uh, this discussion in terms of, uh, um, you know, to be a very broad uh, discussion and to, to get these uh, ideas which, you know, it, they don't have to be uh, scientific uh, in, in, in total. We can, we can get, uh, we can open up this discussion in that, uh, uh, in the subject way. Uh, okay, uh, you, can, you can use yeah, this I can chat. Move. Yes, you can ask her and I can see the, uh, the questions in chat as so well just, just to do the muting to mute muting me and, and to give you okay so uh, no no huh? just... no I no no okay it's yeah. okay okay yeah. so uh the thing is that uh, so about the patterns this is the the, the easiest way is to explain um uh, for birds and 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 school of fishes so uh, for a long time, physicists. So there is a whole a whole uh, branch studying this collective behavior. And what we found out is that for a long time we thought that actually uh, uh, birds uh, only follow the the birds in some radius around them. But then there was an experiment done by by scientists in 2007 where they actually showed that birds follow six to seven birds closest to them. So it doesn't matter, the distance is not that important, but the, 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 they kind of made, make an order about this. With fishes, it's even more complex. Um, uh, depending on how they, uh, uh, their, what they define as a, as a neighborhood, uh, based on this, you will have different kind of these patterns. So basically here we show that interaction is something that, uh, that kind of uh, decides on, on the patterns that, that we can see in, in, in a nature. And uh, if we talk about physical system, this is also true. So um, um, there is a very important, so uh, paper, Anderson is a physicist, Philip Anderson is a physicist. He, he got a Nobel prize for doing something else, but very seminal paper uh, called More is Different. I really recommend it. It's a very short paper. It's beautiful. It uh, tells about this story. So physicists, especially people working in in in, uh, in CERN, for instance, um, they they search for these basic laws of interaction. Okay, and and they want to understand this. And this is an important thing, of course. 
But uh, even if we know these basic laws of interaction, if we have a large number of, of constituents interacting, the behavior, this emergence behavior will be very different, okay? So uh, the fact that we know basic laws does not uh, tell us what emergence will, uh, will be in the end, because we have to also understand this network of interactions, and this is what shapes uh, the, 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 this collective behavior we see. And this is true for Cosmos too. So it's not strange that we see these similar patterns in, in, different, in, different, uh, in different systems, which at first sight are not connected, but in some sense they are, okay? About uh, our technical uh, thing is that um, the technical question, so uh, the data, a lot depends on the availability of data. So available data means that I prefer to work with public data. So, uh, so I don't have this uh, um, jeopardizing privacy of, 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 of people involved in this. And usually it depends on, uh, on, uh, on, on specific thing I like to study. So I'm studying, okay? So the choice of the system will depend a lot on, the, on, lot on this. Um, uh, and of course, how we collect the data will depend a lot on this. Uh, for Twitter, definitely we will use APIs, but with t Twitter, there's a lot of different kinds of problems that you have to keep in mind. So even if you use API, uh, Twitter only selects for you 1% of, of of, of the data set. So you really have to work on, on this to collect the, the full data set for, for a specific uh, uh, thing. If you do this kind of, um, if you collect the data from, from simple streaming, okay? Of course, if you collect the data related to specific hashtags, then it's a, it's a different, different thing. Uh, for for analysis, network analysis, uh, we are lucky that we are living in an open uh, software <laughs> world. Uh, so our colleagues uh, develop a very nice uh, module called NetworkX, which you can use freely, and if you're a Python user, and it's very it's very helpful to to use uh, use it to study uh, the structure of networks. But we are heavily based on, on programming. So I mostly do my research using Python when, when it's something that doesn't uh, demand a lot of uh, memory or a lot of time. So Python now has a very, lot, very nice set of, of, of modules and, and, and tools that can help you from collecting the data, mining the data, curating the data, uh, storaging the data, uh, analyzing the data from different point of view, because now we also have this, um, the whole set of tools that are actually able to extract the information from text. So this is beautiful. You can extract emotions, you can extract uh, keywords, you can extract uh, uh, context, you can extract many, many things. And this is really beautiful thing. And actually, there are, there are tools in, in, in Python to do this without actually, you know, learning how to, to, to create the model by yourself. So someone actually done it before you. And, um, uh, but for numerical simulations, we often prefer to use C because it's faster. So I didn't advertise much, but uh, my laboratory, so Scientific Computing Laboratory and the Institute of Physics Belgrade is the host of one of the largest uh, clusters in this part of region, in this region uh, that can be used for scientific purposes. So we are not commercial, we are not using it for commercial purposes. And of course there are clusters for commercial purposes that are much bigger and stronger than our cluster, but for scientific use, and um, uh, it's actually meant for Serbian scientific community. So it's not just for physicists or not just for, for people working in our laboratory. You can apply it for time at our cluster and, and uh, use it for your, just it's important to be for scientific purposes. Uh, so we have a, a large resources, but we prefer to do this a kind of 
Uh, cluster, uh, so cluster is uh, is uh, is uh, is uh, uh, a set of large number of uh, computers. Um, so uh, while we can uh, use um, for 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 instance for uh, a lar large scale analysis for uh, analysis of large scale data, so large number of data set, you often have to use several computers in parallel to actually analyze them. Mm -hmm. For numerical simulations also, a uh, typical thing for numerical simulations is that uh, you want to explore the whole set of parameter space and for each that set of parameters, you need to start with different initial conditions so you can average out. So basically you need to run large, large number of, of, of numerical simulations and cluster allows you to do this in parallel on many different computers. And of course, for, for scientific purposes in, in this field, uh, there is a Hadoop cluster that we already have on our cluster that can actually help you to work with large number of, of different data sets. So it's, it's a kind of important thing. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, just, just a little bit to go back on the, the data, uh, which uh, data you use? How do you use public public data? If you don't use Twitter, uh, how exactly you use public data? And then we're turning to Alexander Ostoich question, which will be in Serbian language. Okay. Okay, so um, uh, so you asked me about the public data. So uh, uh, usually, you uh, for many online uh, systems, they make their own dump of uh, data dump. So, for instance, Stock Exchange makes every three months, every quarter, so four times a year. So every three months, they make a dump of their database, okay, with all the details, okay? So they put it online. So in that sense, it's a publicly available data. They give it for anyone who wants to do research or something else, because people often uh, develop these uh, different kind of, of, of tools to uh, update on their website or other things. Okay, so they use automatically uh, things. And what's uh, the source? Stock data? You said stock. Stock Exchange is a, is a, is a website mm -hmm. that uh, is actually so Stock Overflow is uh, one network in, on the for this kind of website, but it's actually a network of question and answer websites. Okay, so basically what you can do is to find there is a web archive uh, having their data sets, okay? So it's about uh, questionnaires. Yeah, it's questions and answers where people interact with each other. They, um, uh, they, uh, and they ask questions, they answer questions, they discuss through comments and try to make the best answer to a specific question, okay? So it's a kind of social um, network that, that is, uh, the intention of this network is to build corpus of knowledge in a certain field. Okay, so that's why it's interesting for us. We studied uh, in uh, this collective knowledge building, but uh, but it's also interesting from the, the point it's a, it's a typical social system. Okay. But but this is not the only data sets that we are using. Uh, we in the previous time we downloaded data sets from different kind of blogs. Uh, public data means that it's published online, so it can be uh, uh, seen by anyone. Uh, with Twitter, uh, Twitter is very interesting, but the Twitter can be um, uh, for Twitter you have to ask permission, okay? Because they want to know who is going to use the data in what purposes. Mute me. Okay, so the next question will be asked by Andrei Svetic. Maybe we can we can get you in, Andrei. If you can ask question, just ask you to mute. Uh, hi. Yes. Uh, 
yeah, I will follow the, the English pattern. So I was just wanted to ask, uh, what do you think about some ethical concerns? I think partially you, uh, okay. Uh, I think partially you can actually, you, you said that uh, you rely on public data, but still, I mean, there is a possibility of uh, some kind of uh, privacy uh, problems with uh, collecting these data. So do you actually need, uh, do you need uh, some kind of uh, applications for, uh, in a way, uh, participating in an online experiments or, or something like that? So do you actually, do you have the, uh, do you have some knowledge about uh, about the solutions to these ethical conundrums? I mean, I think that they are actually the same in the social science uh, as well, you know, when you're actually doing an uh, experiment or a, or a survey in, a, in an offline surrounding. So I think actually this exaggerates the, the question of, of ethics in research. So it would be interesting to hear what do you think about that? Oh, sorry, you're muted. Sorry. Okay, so now it's okay. So uh, let me uh, explain. So there are two different aspects. So uh, I didn't mention, but also in this, uh, in computational social science, people also do experiments, okay? And there is a whole um, um, a set of, of tools developed in these purposes, okay? And in this case, of course, they, they ask for, for, for permissions and, and all ethical, like participation in the experiment and 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 um, and uh, sharing their data and so on. Okay. Usually, uh, online sites typically ask this in advance, so they use these kind of um, um, disclaimers that you sign when you when you join to community that your data, the things you are doing are public. Okay. Um, uh, what we try to do when we collect the data, if we are the ones that are collecting data, is that we try, it, first of all, we usually anonymize the data right away. Um, in the moment we're collecting it, uh, we try to uh, remove all possible uh, information which is related to, to personal information. So any type of images are usually removed, any type of email addresses and similar things, okay? So this is something that we try to do uh, in advance, in the moment when we are collecting the data. Um, uh, some uh, sites ask you to, um, to ask permissions from them um in order if you want to collect the data from from their websites from their online communities and in this case we also have to follow these kind of uh of rules okay so it depends on the situation to situation um we really try to because typically because now there is a whole movement of open science and open data our practice uh, in our practices that when we do research we also share the data sets on which we've done the research. So someone else can actually use these data and um, recheck our uh, findings or they can use the data for something else, okay? So in that case, we really try to do um, anonymization and, and only share the data that kind of helps um, recreating what we found out without text or similar other things. There is a whole problem with the data sets is that we usually think that anonymization is enough for, for, um, for kind of hiding the identity of people involved in this. But today we know that we also need to do some kind of randomizations and some work we've done previously actually uh, can help in these directions. So there is a whole uh, research done on this, that you keep certain properties of the system, 
but you kind of high, really hide the identity of, of the. I hope. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I hope you uh, you're happy with the answer. Uh, it is very complex uh, issue uh, about how to anonymize the data and uh, uh, how to assess this question if you uh, don't have consent uh, from the participants of the, the study. Um, or maybe some consent is given uh, when a uh, contract is made uh, between uh, the person and uh, the website. So these are all the, the questions and possible possibilities when doing the, the research. Uh, I would like to give floor to uh, Slavica uh, and maybe Maria can tell us something more about uh, the data uh, and uh, the publicly available uh, sources for researchers. I guess the slides I wanted to ask uh, uh, this. My, maybe you want to uh, add something more, Slavica, to your questions. Uh, the question, just let me uh, do this muting and unmuting because we are in the same room. Um, okay, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Aha, uh -huh. okay. Hello to everybody. Uh, thank you very much, Maria, for such a great lecture. And I'm very much interested into your field of work. I'm a student at master studies. Uh, these are sort of interdisciplinary studies at the university. And we had a course in uh, social network analysis by using R as a computer uh, program. So uh, this is very interesting for me to learn that uh, we have uh, some institution that is dealing with uh, well, not the same thing, but pretty much similar. And as I'm dealing with with it now, currently for completing of my studies, I'm very much interested uh, in your uh, data sets. That's why I asked this question, if it's available for research. Uh, so uh, uh, the data sets that uh... Uh, that we published, yes, definitely, yes. Usually there is a link on papers about uh, uh, where you can find the data, okay? So if uh, if you want, you can send me an email so I can send you the specific links for, for yeah. data sets. But I can also share with you, if you're specifically interested in social networks, there is a few more resources that you can use. There is a large Stanford, uh, uh, Stanford, uh, large network data sets where you can find different kind of social network data uh, so like from from different kind of online uh, communities um uh, typically uh online com from online communities is is usually easily available the only thing that um we are not able to share are usually the data from cell phones okay because mm -hmm. Even the data we had were from 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 uh, data for development challenge. So we got the data for a certain amount of time, and we had to erase it after it. So I don't really have the data. <laughs> okay. Thank you very Thank you much. Know, but please send me an email. I'll, I will gladly send you the links that that can help you. Thanks. Uh, okay, so uh, now I can see Alexander Ostrich question. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, he said, uh, he wrote in Serbian, and I will try to translate to make this all English conversation. Uh, in regard to the constructs of uh, sociophysics, uh, it is often uh, about analogy, anal, anal, analogy, analogy, analogy. analogy of physical uh, particles and people uh, as parts of society. 
uh, and uh, in this case uh, we are applying these uh, rules to the society and to uh, from person a to person b um, and uh, what are the conclusions can you tell us about the conclusions about the rules uh, about some ideas that that you you got through this process of of these uh, analogies and applying these uh, rules and structures and algorithms from physics to the society and to these systems uh, so um, and also uh, are there uh, what is the success rate of these processes that you are dealing with um, in terms of predictions so uh, you you said that there are ways to predict some uh, outbursts and uh, that uh, in these social structures uh, first you see the interactions and then you can also um, see some points where uh, inter, you know intensity of interactions uh, inten uh, uh, is higher or something like that the outbursts happen at some point uh, so uh, can we really predict uh, events social events by uh, using the algorithms from sociophysics i guess this is the main question just to do the meeting as to mute and so uh, so i don't really know whether there um there's the works that actually dealt with with you know statistical success of or statistics of success of these approaches so there are several books that uh, uh, so i recommend social atom from mark buchanan so this is a very good book from from this point of view where he actually explains the whole idea um, uh, the the best thing that I, I can say regarding predictability is actually applying uh, this methodology in, in in epidemic spreading there is a whole group of colleagues working in in, in epidemic spreading uh, where they applied use physics and, and complex network theory to predict the outbursts of, of epidemics. For instance, they were able to show in 2009, but news were not interested in this, that um, this swine flu will not spread. So we are not going to have pandemic. But they also were able to, to predict that this COVID-19 will be pandemic and 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 before it actually happened, but uh, unfortunately, this this didn't catch up with with politicians. Um, so in this sense, this is where usually uh, we this, we see these kind of of, uh, of successes. Also, uh, there is a whole a group of scientists working in predicting uh, uh, this economical crisis where this is a kind of interesting thing to find when when the bubble starts to to grow and and to try to predict when it will uh, whether and whether it will uh, burst and when um, in, uh, in 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 uh, from our from my point of view I'm not that much interested in prediction I'm more interested in understanding the processes behind it uh, but I would say that it would be nice to uh, see with this election data that we use uh, whether uh, we can actually think about more suitable um, election uh, process or election rules for, for countries or something like that. That would be an interesting thing to, to, to study for, from, from my point of view. But uh, there are several papers, uh, review papers that you can look at and then use this as a, as a, as a reference point. Um, the, here, the analogy is not one to one. So we have to be, of course, careful with this. And, and in Social Atom, the book I mentioned, you can really see this kind of, of, of uh, uh, kind of in, you know, interplay between, between physics and, and sociology on the other side. But uh, uh, we also have to be careful in that sense, 
Uh, I also notice very often that uh, marketing people and, and, and uh, data scientists or people working in industry um, use the data to predict different kind of like influencers or social spreaders and so on uh, using machine learning techniques. And this is fine up to a certain extent. We today know that actually um, the question of who's going to be an influencer is not just about the position in the network, but also about the context and, and about the situation. So it's not that easily predictable. <laughs> and this comes from science, actually. So people actually study this kind of, uh, of stuff. So um, uh, in that sense, uh, we are only missing one link in the, all of this. And I think it's starting to develop quite well now. It's the experiments. So uh, we have empirical data that we extract the information from it. We have um, models that can help us to further develop this idea. But uh, what is very important for physics is the fact that you can close the, 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 the triangle by experiments. And I think now in, in, in social sciences, uh, we see more and more opportunities for this. And this is going to be really, really, really interesting in the future. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's go now to Alexander Ostoyevich. He is going to uh, ask question. He can ask. He can do it in Serbian, uh, and uh, we would like to to clear this up. Okay. Sada elčujemo Alexandra. Okay. It's true. Čujemo. Čujemo se. Dobre, ovaj, samo pitanje je, if it's not one-on-one, -on -one, who determines the proportion and the situation of using analogy from the sphere of physics and sphere of socio, socio-physics? Um, so, if it's not... so it's it's not, it's not the, like, um, I mean, what do you mean by proportion, okay? It's, okay. It's okay, not... So it's we not... Can... Uh, I'll try to make it clear. Okay. We have we have the the um, the particles as, as particles in physics, and we have the characteristics of human beings as particle of the society. So when do we transfer characteristics from physics to the sociophysics or sociology, and in which circumstances are we transfer uh, characteristics of human beings in the sphere of particles, if I'm making uh, myself clear. So who determines the proportion of when to use the char um, characteristics in one time and another between sociology and physics? So is there any rule to use uh, analogy, similarities? Okay, so it's 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 quite, it's a new field. So there is no rule and I don't think okay. that's going to work, okay? Uh, the thing is that, uh, uh, the most uh, amazing thing for me in, in this is that um, we have seen how people vote, okay? And, and there is some, some universal pattern that we see from country to country, okay? Because the rules are the same. But what is more interesting for me is that I see the same pattern in some other system, okay? So there are certain things that don't depend on specific properties of, 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 of a system or specific properties of human, okay? So in that sense, this is where we can use the analogy from physics. But there are certain things that cannot, so they're, they're probably, not probably, but there are systems that, well, where you don't see this kind of universal behavior. And I assume that in this case, you really need to, you know, look at specific uh, uh, specific uh, properties of of of, of, uh, of of particles or humans, so to say. Okay, um, so it will depend on on a question you're trying to ask, ask and on a system or phenomena you're trying to study. Okay, so uh, whenever we do this, we need to be careful in that sense. Okay. Uh, I said about this, um, uh, these influencers, okay? What people usually do, they study the, the structure of, of, uh, of, of 
uh, of, of a connection network, for instance, on Twitter, how many followers you have, uh, how often you tweet, and so on. And then you use this as a, as a kind of prediction for 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 um, for who's going to be a good spreader or something. Okay, but of course, in this case, this is not enough because we realize that just the position in the network is not enough. So probably there are other things you have to include in, in, in your model for predicting it. So I would say there is no, you know, there is no thumb rule that will tell you, okay, so now I'm going to use this kind of, you try, okay? And then you, that's why um, the, the, this combination of empirical analysis, theoretical modeling and experiment is an important thing. That's, that's the most thing I can say. So to say. Thank you. So uh, now uh, we actually see that uh, there are some uh, ways or methodology that we can apply to social systems, but uh, everything depends from a, a system uh, and um, everything there, there are no, it's not possible to do the analogy just to to use the methods on a, on a, on a social system and, and to get some outputs. Okay, I would like to ask Surgeon if he can take the floor and ask the question. Okay, so do you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, thanks for really really interesting lecture. I mean, complexity theory is quite interesting and and as a sociologist i might say uh, truly uh, thought provoking especially this kind of stuff uh, like nonlinear determinism which is uh, underneath basically this kind of way new way of doing doing science i mean it's not that much new right now but i think it's really useful however i do have a rather philosophical question sorry about that which pertains to the question of reflexivity one crucial, it seems to me, difference between uh, human beings and atoms is the fact that human beings can have uh, a systematic knowledge about the system. So, you know, uh, unlike birds, we can have uh, a, a, a science about how uh, 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 systems work, how birds flock. We can know how to modify rules. Uh, uh, and in some sense, we can also work on, you know, like uh, on some prediction which would modify the state, the state of the system. So what's the status of this kind of uh, way of doing social science? Does this increase or decrease the contingency of, of, uh, of, of the, of the pre prediction that we are trying to achieve? So the fact that we can have this knowledge does this diminish our ability to change uh, our surroundings, our social environment? Uh, so, uh, okay. Uh, so uh, I didn't mention, but there is a whole um, uh, field that actually, a part of the field, branch of the field that actually tries to develop this um, um, uh, models that include this cell, this learning or adaptability or memory in the system. Okay, and uh, in that sense, uh, social systems are quite interesting and and quite um, uh, challenging for for physicists. In that, you know, having a memory, but we already developed a lot of. Uh, methods and a lot of models that allow us to, to simulate these kind of systems. And while we cannot predict for the specific thing what will happen, but we can actually give some uh, paths of the system. So basically, you can uh, give some probabilities uh, what will happen in the future in that sense. This is how basically uh, many of of, uh, of uh, predictions for for elections work. 
This is how uh, now uh, more and more people develop uh, uh, methods for 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 uh, for epidemic spreading and so on. Because we realize that there is no one path that the system will go, but there are many paths that system will go, and we want to actually catch all of them in some sense and give some some probability. But it's true. Uh, atoms don't learn, real atoms or, or particles in physics, they don't learn. But on the other hand, uh, social systems or social atoms do this. So we need new kind of models and approaches for this kind of stuff. But as far as I know, these, these, these approaches are working in some sense. So I think there was a very nice work done by, by uh, by mathematicians for these elections, uh, the US elections, where they basically didn't say, okay, so Biden will win or Trump will win or something like that, but they had all of these scenarios that can happen and probabilities for these scenarios. And for me, this was very helpful to understand. So I don't know if this answers the, the, the question. I hope, yes. <laughs> yes, yes, thank you very much. Here we have an interesting question coming also from Nicola, uh, who is concerned about predictability of some social events if they, uh, if we catch uh, the the way things work and the, the the patterns at some point, then this may repeat in the future and. Uh, all these uh, social events can be can be predicted and then used by uh, companies and, and politicians to to manipulate the society. I guess this uh, is Nicola's question, but uh, I would like uh, to ask him to to add something to it if if he, if, if if he wants. It's really good to hear. Okay, Nicola. Can you join us? Uh, okay. So, Nicola, are you here or no? Mm -hmm. I don't hear him. Okay. Ako nije onda možeš ti da odgovori za što je napisao. Ok, so, um, um, yeah, there is always um, a possibility to use, uh, not just from physics, from, but from any scientific field, to use the knowledge to uh, kind of for good and for, for bad, for society. Uh, so basically, um, what I was trying, I didn't focus on this much, but what we found out from our um, from our research is that when I mentioned self-organized criticality, okay, so the system is a kind of in a situation where it kind of uh, has some. Uh, it's not even equilibrium, but it has some uh, spot where it likes to go back. Okay, so it relaxes in some sense. And it kind of creates these avalanches so it can relax. And uh, what we found out, yeah, you can, um, uh, you can um, realize what will start the avalanche, but you will never know how large this avalanche will be. Okay, so, so you cannot predict this because the distribution of these avalanches are very, uh, are very, uh, very broad. So uh, what is the, 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 the main take a home message from this for me is that um, sometimes you can try to trick the society in some sense, but uh, you will never know how large will your uh, manipulation be. Um, uh, I, I had a tendency to hear about mixing of, uh, of, of different kind of different countries in, in US elections and so on in the, for the previous elections in 2016. 
Uh, and I was uh, interested to actually understand what is the extent of this. And um, recently our colleagues from, from US, so Duncan Watts, um, uh, he's a physicist, but he's actually a professor of sociology for last, I don't know, 15 years. And um, he actually showed that uh, the amount of, of, of uh, online media like Twitter and Facebook in, uh, in, um, as a source of information for people is, 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 is a very small fraction, okay? So you can try, there is, on, on in, there is a publication in Nature in this year that actually showed that mass media are the one who, who, are, who have the, more, the largest impact in that sense. So mostly television, uh, less printed media and so on. So basically the whole hysteria that we are seeing for the last four years about Russian specific meddling in US election, I'm sorry, but probably it's not true. Uh, it's just that the, the system was on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on this sweet spot where like in the middle and kind of, you know, slipped to one on the, or the other side. So um, uh, there are other problems that can happen, and this is usually related to algorithms basically creating these echo chambers. This is a big deal. And uh, we still don't understand how to kind of, we kind of know uh, why is this happening, but we're not sure whether the algorithms are the only reason this happened but there are people studying this a lot and trying to understand how to prevent this kind of, of behavior. Uh, the same way as uh, social systems relaxes in this self-organized state, unfortunately, um, innovation is in the same situation. So basically when you do some uh, research or you make some uh, progress in, in science, it's very hard to predict what will be the real outcome of this. So it's impossible. So in that sense, whether we can try to, you know, um, we can try to prevent certain things, but I'm not sure whether we are really, really able to do this. So either we are going to stop do science or we are going to, <laughs> uh, try to, to uh, work on it when, when the situation happens. Thank you. Uh, yes, it is good to show the possibilities of uh, algorithms and predictions so that, uh, uh, you know, society is warned that, that uh, private companies can do that as well. Uh, so this is actually the role of, of uh, social scientists and other uh, people, you know, participating in this process, physicists uh, and uh, all, the, all the scientists from different spheres uh, that can help us see what can uh, happen actually if something is misused or used in some way. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, for the answer, Maria. And uh, uh, maybe Gelena now would like to ask a question. Hello. Um, well, actually, um, I wanted to, to ask, is there any uh, uh, situation where interpretation of, so, uh, of social dynamic data are in collision? Uh, can you uh, elaborate on that? I, I, uh, um, I don't uh, know. Uh, for example, um, in uh, usually in uh, some scientific uh, um, research, you could interpret uh, data uh, for for this different perspectives. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I uh, to be honest, uh, I uh, uh, we never came to this situation. But um, what we usually try to do in science. Uh, in, in the sociophysics is that we worry about whether, so we usually uh, have a conclusion about some, I don't know, about some mechanism, okay? And 
here, the patterns that we are seeing are the consequence of that mechanism. And what we usually do is we try to develop quantitative methods how to conclude this. So usually we create these null models that kind of show or confirm that our uh, that the things that we are claiming are not a, a consequence of chance, but rather some uh, consequence of of uh, of, uh, of some rules. Okay, my. Um, uh, Typically, what we are doing is that we don't just do the empirical analysis. That's why we create models, because empirical analysis only provides one, one point, one data point, so to say. But models allow us to explore around this. So this is what we usually do, because we, uh, what I would like to have in the future is to collaborate more with also social scientists, because they typically um, have a little bit different approach and different views. And, and, and in that sense, they know more about some social uh, theory about certain social processes. So I kind of see this as, as, a, as, a, as a good, good uh, thing to do. But this is how we usually deal with this, you know, different kind of interpretations, so to say. I don't know if this is uh... okay. Thank you, thank you. So models are kind of kinds of interpretations. So they kind of help you to uh, have a conclusion that is 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 kind of solid, kind of solid. Okay, so uh, they. Um, they kind of help you not to have, um, they kind of change, not change, but uh, they're substitute for experiment, okay? In some sense, because uh, I, I've tried as a scientist to, to also participate or, or to, to create an experiment, a social experiment, and it's hollow, hollow I mean, it's a hell for, for, for us because in physics, you can control things quite easily in some sense. It can be hard, but it's not impossible. But in social systems, when you create experiments, it's kind of, you know, there are so many things that can go wrong, mm -hmm. many biases. And, and uh, in that sense, uh, you know, we know how to deal with this in models, but I hope in the future, uh, experiments will also be an important aspect of this. Thank you. Okay, Damir, Damir would, like, would like to ask a question. Just a moment. <laughs> Hi, all. Uh, I have a question. on bi trebao nešto da kaže. Aj. Damir. Um, cool. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. So, my question is about providing the data and get access to the data as a scientist. Mm -hmm. Like I'm right now working from the IT company and we have uh, access to the uh, users of data of the our application, which is million of the users. So how you as a scientist can get access to the data or what's the future of the providing data to do, to do research as a scientist? Will we have like scientists mining for their own data or asking uh, companies and corporations to provide your research materials? So uh, already there are a lot of ways to do this. So uh, in uh, 
there is one way that we usually apply and that's uh, you know publicly available kind of data sets but of course uh, companies uh, that are doing specific things related to 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 uh, like you know having these online uh, communities uh, different kinds of stuff they also uh, can offer the data sets if they're interested um, what we are currently missing in this case, we typically do this in a way that we sign non-disclosure agreement. This means that these data sets cannot be shared, only uh, a, a, a limited number of people can uh, use these data sets. So only people who sign the non-disclosure agreement. Uh, you have to be really careful where you store these data sets that, so they don't get stolen. Um, what else? Um, uh, the, there is usually an issue with this because we try to promote this open data and open science uh, practice. So in this case, basically, it's very hard to 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 uh, to give this data set to to other scientists so they can actually recheck your your conclusions. So uh, and usually companies uh, want something in return. So in, for instance, um, while I was in Alto University, we got a question from from a company called Web of Trust. So they collect the data from from uh, its crowdsourcing uh, uh, platform where people provide the data about the. Uh, trustworthiness of a certain website. So basically they're phishing or trying to find phishing websites and uh, websites that kind of are used for, for a different kind of, of, of crimes in some sense. So they, they steal the data or they steal your uh, credit card data and this kind of stuff. Um, and what they have noticed is that uh, people sometimes um, uh, Although the website is very legit, so it's okay, but uh, they couldn't, I don't know, do some transaction or something else. They got angry and they then write a very negative report. So it's kind of missing their uh, information, okay? So in that case, the company came with a specific need and um, uh, we only could use that for their purposes. We couldn't use it for, for research. Luckily, we didn't do much because after some time company uh, was considered very fishy and everything else. So we didn't get involved in, in this kind of situation. So there are several ways you can do this. Um, uh, what will be a big step in the future? And I think, uh, I see Facebook is is trying to do this, whether it's on 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 real purposes or or it's just they, their way of trying to show that they're good. Uh, they try to uh, kind of make um, random version of the, their data, the data they share with with the community, okay, and then uh, they try to kind of. Uh, either aggregate the data or, or kind of remove uh, any type of uh, private information or, or uh, personal information of users so they can actually share these data sets. And they developed the whole set of, of, of tools to do this. And I hope this is going to go in the future uh, even more because in the end, uh, I have a problem because Facebook has has a research team. So there are uh, people, like my colleagues, so physicists, computer scientists, sociologists, and others working in their development and research team who publish papers, okay? And they have some conclusions that no one can actually check. I mean, no one can, you know, try to recheck these kind of conclusions because they have the data and so on. So I would like to see this kind of behavior uh, as, a, as a past in some sense, as a history, okay? So I hope in the future we will be, we'll have more open uh, data sets. But in general, uh, as a scientist, I'm open for, for companies if they want to understand the, the behavior of their users in that sense, yes, or they want to optimize their processes in some sense, Yes, I'm open to, to, to help them with these kind of things. 
Thank you. Okay, uh, one uh, final question is given to the person in the room, Mr. Vukalovic from e-security organization uh, is going to ask a question. I'm going to uh, translate it. To, to cover a condition, but it's complicated. <laughs> the process. Me, da li ste u tim analizama, ne znam kako je to generalno da zove, uh, da li je poznato, da li je neko koristio, recimo, tri vrste podataka, pa nego ostali. Uh, to je meteorološka situacija, neka generalna zdravstvena slika oblasti koja je mena i sunčeve mene. O, sunčeva ona zračenja, um, tako da je. Da li je to uticalo? To je prvo. Uh, just, uh, maybe you heard, but uh, the question was if uh, some specific kind of data are used uh, that uh, Maria knows of, such as uh, meteorological data, uh, health data, and uh, some kind of uh, Sun bi biological data, sun uh, related uh, data, uh, and okay. The question, second question. Second question is uh, manipulation, ruling control. Kako se na taj način može mogu menjati rezultati u nam da bi bili drugačiji. Rezultati čega? Pa. U stvari ne rezultati, nego stanje. Kako se unapred stanje može, obzirom na vašu nauku, može da se koncerte kako bi je ili kako bi bilo, kako onda manipulacijom da se so, postigne uh, drugi... I think we rezultati. already had a lot of, lots of questions about manipulation and uh, I don't think there is uh, really a final uh, answer to that. But uh, uh, the, the first one uh, is uh, interesting and uh, it, it is about if Maria uh, have come across or heard of this kind of uh, uh, combi combination of data in, in any kind of uh, uh, So, uh, I know that, uh, so not in my field, but uh, there is a field that actually is doing uh, applying machine learning in environmental science. So they already have a kind of um, um, cross correlation between uh, meteorological data and uh, and uh, health data, so to say. Uh, I don't know if anyone used the, the solar, so it's not about the sun, but it's actually about the, the this uh, solar um, magnetic storm. uh, solar storms or magnetic storms. Yes, so I, I don't know about this. Uh, what what I can say about the the data about the solar thing is that. <laughs> Uh, so there is something called circadian clock or circadian rhythm, which is a typical thing for, for anyone living on Earth, usually any living uh, like uh, higher order organisms, so humans too. So we basically, um, our activities is highly related to, to uh, sun activity. So we are usually uh, very active during the day, less active during the night. And you can see this in any social data. So you really see these circadian waves, <laughs> so to say. And um, uh, while it's an interesting thing that usually these stock exchange um, websites are, are for the whole world. So you can have people from different parts of the world. Somehow it kind of tends to synchronize. So even, you know, probably a lot more active part of the group kind of leads this uh, circadian thing. Uh, about the manipulation, just to, to, to answer shortly, uh, um, in, in this cyber emotion project, our idea was to also understand whether there is a possibility to use these bots. So, so these are scripts, okay, used in, in online communities. The, uh, to kind of uh, lower down the negativity in the system. So basically, uh, news websites are typically very negative and people come there to fight. 
that's that's my kind of drives the community, you know. And um, we wanted to understand whether there is a possibility to put a boat that will actually kind of help the community to lower down this negativity. Uh, yes, emotional boats can help. That's true. But typically, uh, up to just a certain extent. So what we saw that in a community is where already people come to help each other and be positive, they only promote this kind of behavior. Um, I don't know any type of boat in, 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 in news websites that was actually used to calm down the situation. And we today know that boats on, on, on Twitter can actually have uh, a positive or negative influence on this. So, yeah. But this is not a, a consequence of sociophysics. <laughs> this is a consequence of, of, of human behavior in some sense in creation of, of bots. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's already almost uh, two hours. This talk is very inspiring. And uh, I had to attach myself to this uh, discussion uh, with uh, uh, some information that we already uh, did some kind of research uh, with Twitter data and weather data, and we compared this uh, to get uh, uh, humidity and temperature highly correlated with, uh, uh, with actually uh, frequency posting. So the, that uh, is the main uh, a finding, and we hope to write a paper about that. Uh, this is uh, uh, this is different in, uh, for, for example, in the UK, and UK is different from the rest of the nine countries we we had in this kind of research. Uh, you know, uh, for some countries, when we have high temperature and uh, high humidity, uh, it's one thing, and uh, the reverse thing is 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 uh, the result is is um, you know different. So uh, we're going to to dedicate some time to that as well to to make it uh, final. But uh, uh, temperature and humidity are really uh, str strong strongly correlated with uh, uh, posting behavior, posting frequency in uh, uh, all these uh, countries. So we're going to uh, work work on. On that uh, and um, maybe uh, one uh, uh, final uh, question bef before we finish this discussion for the today uh, this is going to be on YouTube tube as well and uh, available to the community so anyone can look at this uh, uh, is about emotions uh, how you uh, what was the way you really uh, analyzed emotions in the cyber emotions project and uh, did you use words or uh, some other ways to, uh, to, to capture emotions and maybe emotions spreading through, through the social media? Can you tell me something little about that? So, uh, okay, so... Um, the project was uh, as a kind of uh, one of the first projects that actually was talking about this sentiment analysis and collective emotions in cyberspace. And um, uh, at the moment, at the beginning, we used these supervised learning. So basically, we didn't use words, we used text. But uh, the idea was to use a machine learning algorithm uh, uh, to learn on pre labeled text, whether it was positive, negative, or neutral. And then based on this uh, learned um, activity or, or uh, this algorithm that was taught how to, uh, how to classify the text, we used the classifier for, for blogs, I think, for, for, for a dig website and for um, other long text, kind of long text uh, data sets. Uh, in the meantime, uh, our colleagues also develop an algorithm that is based on, um, on words. So there is effective English dictionary or a dictionary of effective English words where each word has a, 
uh, was marked or or was um, kind of labeled uh, in three dimensions. One dimension was arousal. So arousal is a kind of um, how strong are your emotions? They can be positive or negative. So the balance tells you how positive or negative your emotions. And there is a third dimension which was never used for online text. It, it's called dominance. So this third dimension was never used, but these two dimensions, arousal and balance, were used, and we used it for for uh, for um, arousal and balance. Arousal and balance. Balance yes. is how strong. And no, no, arousal is how strong is the the, and the balance the, is positive or and negative. Balance, okay. The balance okay. tells you how positive or negative, and based on this uh, dictionary yeah. of one thousand five hundred words or something like that. Uh, they basically classify the text, develop a method to classify each text based on this. And this is considered as unsupervised learning because basically it's just counting the words in, in, in a text. Of course, from that point of view, until today, there are several um, um, uh, classifiers that would develop. Uh, one is uh, Vader. So you can find it online, it's, it's freely available, but it is now used for the social media texts. There is, of course, anti-strength, which, is, uh, which, is, which was developed during our, our uh, project. So colleagues from Wolverhampton developed it. And there is Lumic, you already know, which is actually a much more, um, a more complex uh, uh, algorithm or software that actually does not just provide about the emotional content of the text, but also gives these different kind of categories from which you can actually extract uh, other uh, types of emotion, like Did anger. You and lists or the, the, you you, the one you're uh, using. Yeah, Lubic. Okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are many, uh, many algorithms that can be used. And uh, Lubik is not, unfortunately, uh, publicly available. You have to buy it. The license for it, but uh, Vader is 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 free, and I think Senti strength can be used freely for for scientific purposes. So yeah. It's... One question. Oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One, one question about the algorithms that you use, and you you, uh, you feel artificial intelligence uh, or in machine learning. Which Algorithms you see useful for social science, uh, and are there many of them? them which, which exactly you see uh, as? So definitely, uh, the 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 machine learning or or uh, deep learning algorithms for extracting different kind of information from text. That that's very helpful for social scientists. Just we have to keep in mind that. Um, Algorithms need to be updated and rechecked all the time. So it's not something that we will do now and that's going to you know, last forever. I don't expect this kind of stuff. Um, uh, there is a whole bunch of algorithms that can uh, incorporate network properties with machine learning. So this, I didn't use them, but we are planning in the future to use this kind of uh, information. So they can be really helpful. Um, what worries me is that uh, uh, very often we see, uh, because now machine learning algorithms are available, of course, to everyone, because you have modules in Python or R, and they're very often used in data science. And uh, what worries me is that um, um, uh, we see more and more people just correlating something with <laughs> two data sets or two properties or something like that without actually going deeper into, into, into what is behind this. Correlation is not causation. And we also need to keep this in mind. So this is something where I see a kind of slippery um, slope place where we can actually um, lose uh, kind of control, okay? But this doesn't mean that we shouldn't use machine learning algorithms. Machine learning algorithms are very, very helpful. Just don't expect they will answer all our questions, okay? Science, I mean, I, I often hear, hear 
that people say, uh, okay, artificial intelligence will, you know, uh, will uh, sub be su a good substitute for science. It will not. No. <laughs> it's a very helpful tool. We shouldn't, uh, you know, say not use it, but but we have to be really aware what are its possibilities. Because in the end, I can give you a very simple example. Uh, most of the algorithms um, used, for instance, for predictive mobility or something else, were very useful until we had this epidemic where we were locked for month, month and a half, two months. And after that, we changed the way we are behaving. So in that sense, while they, they were very useful for the time before that, any kind of structural change in the system, they stop being very useful. So they cannot predict something that is all not already in the data. So this is what, so combination of, of traditional scientific approaches and machine learning is very helpful, I would say. But not, you know, one thing to, to change or be a substitute for the other.